Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you for being here with us. And in this, you know, 14 sessions, seven weeks. Thank you very much for your work, your effort and your dedication. This is the last session. And hopefully we'll be able to meet many of you in our next in-person stage. And besides, as usual, please remember, sorry, I can't find um, how to, there we go, the next slide. Okay, great. So as usual, please remember that there is live interpretation into, into English and Spanish. So this week, as we have already said, we have, you know, this uh, Thursday workshop on how to design public policies in Latin America. More information. Remember that after the course, we will have a, a final exam. We'll be sending this to you. The exam includes around 30 questions. The exam will be available until 11.59 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, time in the States on Thursday, November the 10th. So that's your deadline. Uh, you have a bit more time to hand in the con concept note until the 24th of November, as you know already. The participants that have attended over 70% of live Zoom sessions and passed the brief final exams exam will receive a participation certificate at the end of the course. This will be awarded by the GCCHE and the IAI. The eligible participations that fulfill these two requirements will be sent this certificate of participation via the email you used to enroll in the course. Also, in November, we will be inviting you to a new event, and hopefully you can participate as well. We will be launching the Climate Hub, which is the portal that includes um, the, the different uh, community, aspects of a community of practice we have been putting together, uh, especially since this year with the first course and the second course. There will be a new course in between March and April 2023. It is entitled Building uh, Climate Resistant Health Sectors and also Environmentally Sustainable uh, Health Sectors. Target audience, hospital administrators, members of administration councils of health centers, long care professionals, those responsible for activity continuity, emergency planners, those responsible for sustainability, public health, health professionals, and pandemics. Please pay attention as individual applicants because it, this is a very interesting course to you. Bien, este, la organización será este, más o menos de la misma manera que fue organizado estos cursos o la misma organización y la aplicación. This will be organized as uh, we will have the same organization as in this course. This will be, the next course will be open. You know, it's a completely open and free course. You won't have to apply. We will have several languages as usual. And I think it's very interesting to announce this so that you can make a note of this uh, to, you know, so that you can remember this interesting course we will have in 2023. As usual, you know, uh, general considerations, please check regularly that your mics are muted, attendance will be verified when you are connected. And if possible, uh, keep your cameras on. 
uh, especially to help the speakers. Uh, the idea uh, then is to have, you know, you ask to answer the questions at the end of the session. And then we will have, a, you know, a goodbye session. And of course, um, then we can answer the rest of the questions by email. Now we would like to introduce our main speaker. It's an honor to welcome her, Pamela, uh, Pamela Pusi Fuentes, uh, who has a master's uh, degree in sociology. She's an expert in policy incidents when it comes to managing bills of law in the National Congress. She has been an advisor in parliament and NGOs and also grassroots movements, uh, rural uh, water, etc. Sorry, uh, Carlos, uh, sorry to interrupt you. You're sharing your screen. Is that okay? Uh, sorry, it's part of the introduction. Uh, that's okay then. Yeah, I didn't mean to, but you're right. Okay, now we're all set. Okay, she has studied the environment, especially water, energy and mining, and social and environmental conflicts. She has participated in Greenpeace and other institutions. She has taught at the University of Santiago in the area of perspective, especially in the health humanism department and she has a political science BA she has participated in the university as well she has a master's degree in sociology she has different studies in uh, in Europe she specializes in human rights in companies in natural resource extraction and public policy for sustainable development So now I would like to give the floor to Pamela Poo. Thank you very much. And uh, I apologize for the background noise. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Because I've changed my mic three times. So if you can hear me well, that's great. Excellent, yes, we can hear you well. Please go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready. So now I need to talk to you about public policy. Uh, that has to do with uh, environmental issues connected with health. Before we start, we need to say that the, we are living through an, a, a, an ecological and climate crisis of uh, terrible proportions from the academia, the civil society, state institutions, and even companies need to uh, you know, boost actions and public policies that promote or, or, or that try to pre prevent this, this 1.5 temperature increase. So this is a huge challenge as a society. Unfortunately, um, we need to say that this, we knew this already because of what was happening in 1972 already. So we're 50 years late regarding the actions that should have been taken at that time. Uh, because the growth, the temperature growth limits already anticipated this scenario we're, we're seeing nowadays. Unfortunately, public policy or the states or those in charge of the states, you know, the governments, um, usually uh, uh, for, uh, neglect these topics and do not address them as quickly as possible. And therefore, from the academia and the civil society, we need to be able to show which realities we see because you know the window of opportunity is closing now we need to address these topics now i think it's important to say as well that this climate and ecological crisis is not just an, uh, a crisis that has to do with the greenhouse gas emissions it also includes biodiversity 
And that is the main challenge that we have, actually, and we, and we can't quite grasp this idea. I believe that climate action uh, is important, but also we are all uh, agents of change. So from you know our work, from our knowledge, we can uh, um, improve public policies. And this is why it's so important to have this type of course where people from you know their position or their work can also create um, boost transformation in order to create major changes in in the in the area of climate. And this is our main challenge as a humankind. Well, after this introduction, I would like to share my screen. So please uh, write in the chat uh, which, you're, which country you're coming from and why you are participating in this uh, workshop and why you need, you know, to uh, disseminate the knowledge you're producing. This is very important because it helps us to see who you are, even if we can't meet in person, we can uh, share all this from different areas. And this is made possible by, uh, you know, our virtual world. As I always say, it's not necessary to participate in heroic actions to be part of the change. Small actions multiplied by millions of people asked and other people can change the world. I think we need to keep this in mind because the climate action we need to take uh, needs to really challenge what we see because climate crisis is not just about a climate crisis and ecology crisis it has to do with uh, the the a crisis related to institutions to democracy so we need to um, help improve things and we need to help states because states cannot act on their own what is citizen participation this is a capacity that citizens have to participate in decision-making processes. These decisions affect collective interests and their own interests as well. Um, examples, if we go to a demonstration, if you want to participate in a specific topic. Therefore, citizen participation implies some sort of involvement in a, a, an area uh, that we're interested in. That's citizen participation. There is also political participation, which is a number of practices through which citizens aim to influence uh, the political activity of the political community. And this is very important for what comes next. When public policies are uh, uh, developed, they are made by the state and the state and this these policies are implemented by ministries and secretariats and the public administration tends to implement these public policies um, which are necessary in order to address the the citizens demands given a specific topic we need to remember that public policy making especially in latin america is sort of mixed why? Because the civil society and the academia, as we will see later on, are very important when it comes to, you know, developing public policies. And also they are making huge contributions regarding the arguments needed to create public policies. The political world doesn't uh, have to know everything. So, uh, the, you know, politicians need this contribution when it comes to public policy making. In this sense, we know that the political participation dimensions are the following. Um, first of all, the elections, which is, you know, limited. Uh, I am Chilean. We have seen this in, my, in, in Chile in particular with many elections that we had never imagined would have taken place because we have a constitutional process, presidential elections, etc. But this doesn't mean that this political participation is not limited. It is limited, but it also uh, shows us that how public policy is developed. The result of an election can also affect this. And for instance, the constitutional process here in Chile on the 4th of September, where, you know, the citizens rejected the 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 proposed constitution and therefore public policy 
takes a different turn because let's say the, the this more aggressive agenda loses so uh, we started talking about issues that have to do with uh, security pensions etc that is not all these topics are not related to the um, proposed constitution therefore the priority topics have changed changed the agenda proposed that by the government will not be implemented in the way that they expected because the, the priorities will be different this is an example also of how elections can change political scenarios um also we have a broader uh, political participation for instance you know decision making referendum plebiscites etc there is also you know wide participation but it this is uh, political participation. We also have uh, activism in ele ele elections and people can participate in topics they're interested in. Also, there is another topic, which is activism that pressures the political system. And this is where we are when it comes to influencing um, the system in order to develop public policy. As I said at the beginning, although it is the governments and the states that suggest public policies, you know, the, the political influence exerted by the academia, the civil society will modify public policy. And this is where this activism comes in. Stakeholders are participating in public policy. We have pressure groups, stakeholders, also interest groups, lobbying activities, interest associations, and they respond to diversity uh, so that social and economic interests are expressed collectively. Therefore, when developing public policy, these elements will always be present and they will be uh, pressuring the system. When we say lobbying, we, we, this term originated in the hotel lobbies where you know people met, and these are not really transparent, let's say, meetings, or they're not open to the public. Therefore, this lobbying is the are these activities that take place or took place originally at, at hotels. But then this became a regulated activity because there are some uh, stakeholders that participate in public policies that have different interests that favor private interests. In this sense, public policy cannot be developed from a, a private uh, perspective. It, it should aim to improve everyone's lives some uh, pressure tools that we have in order to influence public policy. First of all, social media and citizen campaigns, political incidents, managing the interest, and this has to do with influencing reporting and courts. bastante crítico en la cual las redes sociales están cierto eh, teniendo una dinámica en la cual la política pública está siendo bastante tóxica esa construcción en el sentido de que están tratando de girar los ejes o balanzas cierto a través del fake news y la mala utilización de estas redes sociales pero si las redes sociales son bien utilizadas fortalecen a la propia democracia tienen esta dualidad en el to en torno a que pueden favorecer a la democracia o destruirla Estamos en ese punto. ¿Qué hacemos? ¿Cómo regulamos este tema? And eh, we are at that point. Uh, how do we regulate that? These social media um, and this toxic environment that it has become, it can either build and strengthen or destroy democracy. And how can we use it to strengthen public policies when a public policy doesn't have Oh, the population doesn't have the elements and information we can show constructively using social media that the public policy lacks some elements. We are going to see this later, but academia, for example, is doing a lot of advocacy, for example, by going to Congress to make presentations and studies and show all the information that is available around an issue. For example, academia uh, took a very important role in, in showing lawmakers that 
this public policy needed to take partic public participation into account. For example, we have some examples here in Chile, and we were able to introduce some elements that are important. Interest management, which is how can we look for um, in lawmakers or officials from the executive branch? Um, how can we make them receive or listen to our issues if you're talking about glaciers or some ecosystem that is in danger? Uh, we can show the arguments and what is going on so that this all of this background can be on the table so they can work on public policy because as i was saying sometimes they don't have all of this background because it's impossible to read all of the available literature so the closer academia and civil society is to lawmakers the better and this management of interests is related to the mapping of stakeholders that we need to do. We need to map the different stakeholders. If we hypothetically, we have a bill that it has to do with climate change and health, for example. If you are working in that line, we need to map out the stakeholders and who is in favor of uh, addressing these issues, who are the lawmakers that are going to be on our side, who is against it, and so that we can find and identify the people that we can manage our interest with because there's a few of us and we are small groups and the issues are many, we need to be smart about who, how we choose who we want to talk to. Also, when a public policy isn't being addressed or there is a public policy, but it's not appropriate, for example, to be a broad public policy, doesn't meet the requirements, we can show, we can denounce that, we can uh, issue, we can write letters, we can have notes, we can collect signatures of the people who are in agreement around this claiming this and there's also the legal way to promote public policy nowadays eh, on climate change issues because of the climate emergency it is being used to be able to push um, some change and to make governments make decisions on climate change because they are either not meeting the goals that they should or they're not um, correctly uh, designing public policies or they're not doing it as fast as they should. So this is a way to put an issue, bring it uh, to the forefront for the public and to bring visibility to something that is not so visible. So that's important to be able to promote change changing public policies or even to uh, have a public policy that is bad be removed. So this is very possible and, and it's very possible to achieve significant change in this way. What is advocacy? Very quickly, we have specific activities for the purpose uh, aimed at changing laws, policies, practices, and attitudes. Uh, re taking into account disadvantages of a particular group, promote policies that lead to strengthening the protection and realization of human rights, and raise awareness among the public. Regarding health and climate, which is what you have been working on, it's also important to note that this this crisis that we're we're facing uh, advocacy is key 
to change minds. So if we are able to build a significant, significant advocacy efforts, the change in public policy is going to be effective. Sometimes there are public policies that don't really bring down to earth what what and are not really uh, applied and implemented and they don't reflect what is in paper. So the better the advocacy that we do, the better the public policies we're going to have. And these are some of the activities that we can do. There are some that have to do to the electoral process. We can create uh, work on activities that have to do with bringing candidates to take into account or include in their agendas issues that have to do with climate. For example, in Peru, in Chile, in a region, um, both these countries have big glaciers and their protection is important. So our political participation could create, um, lead to public policy. Being involved in campaigns is also uh, something that can be done to support a candidate or a campaign if, especially, of course, they're pushing for something that is one of our concerns. And also running for office, uh, persuade others to vote and, and as well as running uh, for office. I think it's important as well to think of ourselves as political stakeholders. Um, and that would be to be in decision making. That would be a significant jump for anyone to, who wants to do it, but it would be really interesting. We also have uh, those activities that have to do with opinion creation. These, all of these issues have to do a lot with public opinion. So being involved in debates, contacting the media, to show our opinions. This is very important because it uh, helps build arguments. I can imagine several of the people here from different countries have heard about green hydrogen, which is being proposed as a, one of the big solutions as a renewable source of energy. But the thing is, how do we build opinion around this? Because this looks like, sounds like a magic wand that they're um, like a harmless solution for our energy issues. And it, it isn't, it has effects on the territories. And the decision to bring forth this public policy needs to be brought into question. And the way to bring that into question is to look at the arguments that are being brought to the public. And that is key. All sectors need to do this because that's a way to collectively build opinions around something that is being uh, um, shown as something that is uh, just good. And if you look at it in depth, it's not that great. Uh, and to continue with green hydrogen, it's a clean energy, it's a clean gas, but it requires big renewable energy projects that take up a lots of hectares of land and also for green hydrogen, for example, in Chile, because we don't have as much fresh water, we would need to uh, remove the salt from seawater. It also requires a place where there are ports. And if you don't have ports, we need to build them. So it's not, uh, if you go into the details, it's not as easy, uh, something that should would be, uh, as quickly supported by the public. It's a public policy that requires um, the involvement of the different stakeholders that are going to be affected. If a public policy doesn't have the social license, 
what it's going to happen is it's going to be brought to court. And that is what's going to happen. We see that all the time in climate uh, related conflicts. So creating opinion around an issue, it's very important because we are, we can place and, and bring the arguments that policymakers sometimes don't see. Perhaps they don't see them because an engineer or someone with a different profession is thinking at, at the project from their perspective, the engineering perspective, but they're not looking at it from the perspective of the community or the effect in other areas. So it's very important to uh, create opinions because this brings forth uh, a debate. And for example, when we use the hashtag, for example, we put hashtag hydrogen in Twitter, we can see that different opinions come up. And that is a way to, to uh, survey the, the sort of information that is around. In creating opinion, people also can become specialists on issues. And so that uh, also uh, strengthens the reach with the media. We also have some activities that have to do with the institutions and authorities the contacting these authorities that need to be mapped out to have better result, sending supportive messages, requesting interviews. That is one way to, to reach the institutions and to, to show them our view. And we also have activities that have to do with organized political mobilization, which is participating in authorized demonstrations, groups or movements, also joining parties or organizations and contributing to financially support political clauses. Sometimes uh, some political causes get connected to others, but it's, it's important because science the the different uh, types of knowledge are not apolitical they obviously need to contribute to public policy so that we can have a better society so we have all of these activities that we can be involved in to create opinion and it's important to to do this because we can contribute to better policies or to improve the ones that, that are being presented to us. We have some definitions of advocacy as well as the, its effects on practice. It's an activity to modify policies, positions or programs, to intercede, defend or recommend an idea to others, to denounce, bring an important issue to the, attendee, to the attention of our community, to put it on the agenda. There are sometimes issues that are not on, in the agenda. For example, in here in Chile, we have some wetlands that were not being taken into account and their relevance as to mitigate climate change because they absorb methane, um, among other things. Um, it was not taken into account and how important it is also for climate change adaptation. So different environmental organizations who have those so-called turberas, um, which are in the south of Chile and the southernmost part of, of Chile. And so this was, wasn't an environment these bugs was an environment that wasn't appreciated in our country. We have a really long country. Um, and so people who live up north were not aware of this sort of ecosystems. So through advocacy organizations, we're able to put this on this agenda, the extraction that is taking place here, because unfortunately, 
they're being used to bring to uh, sheep or kids. Orchids are used uh, to, for transportation purposes for the moss that is used underneath the, the flowers for shipping. So these organizations reported and denounced the situation and they ended up um, coming to Congress with a bill that is uh, in the eye of the storm right now because there's a ban on extraction due to the severity of the climate crisis. And this bill has raised lots of, of support in the community from citizens in social media massively. So it has started to move forward to uh, prevent extraction in those bogs. So there are some politicians who of course uh, have their their ears open to these issues but there's also lots of citizens who became involved and there's also academia showing with studies why it's important to preserve these ecosystems so we can see the incidents that communities can achieve as together with academia providing solid arguments to fight against those arguments for maintaining extraction in these uh, ecosystems that are also irreplaceable. Those uh, bugs, uh, two centimeters um, of this in this ecosystem grow in one year. So it's not something that we that can be continuously renewed and it also releases carbon. So we see that advocacy helps us put in the agenda some issues that were not visible. It can consist of short-term activities that are specific to realize a long-term vision for change. We, there's a variety of activities uh, to work at the local, provincial, national, and international levels. And it also includes participation of the population in decision-making processes. Without citizen support, it's very difficult to have a public policy um, to come into effect. So we need citizens to feel part uh, and feel involved in that construction. We also need to plan advocacy there needs to be uh, at the minimum a basis because when we plan advocacy we can be more effective uh, to help build public policy so having a mini campaign or to organize how we're going to carry out our advocacy is to identify priorities around the issue that we're going to address uh, and for public policy, it's very difficult to address uh, very broad issues. Uh, it's going to be complex to create a public policy that is specific for that. So we need to determine the main problem, what we want to protect, for instance, or what we want to modify. We need to identify the higher objective of this incidence intervention. We need to establish specific aims, for instance, the wetlands. The wetlands were being filled to uh, construct buildings, you know, there was a land use change. So we wanted to protect wetlands so that we could uh, prevent the loss of major ecosystems that have to do with climate change. And here we need to set specific objectives. For instance, we want a bill of law, we want to protect the bill of law, we want people to get to know this ecosystem because many times you think that you know about something and everyone's know about that and that's not the case so we need to open up uh, our area in order to help public policy making we also need to identify our target audience who are we talking to this is very important when it comes to public policy making 
because, for instance, if a bill of law is uh, presented by the executive branch, then we need to talk to the executive and to that political sector in particular, and after that, we need to talk to citizens. However, if there is a topic that is not led by the executive, if it's the, the citizens that are leading the, the, the topic, then we need to change our strategy. We need to participate in events with politicians so that we can address these topics. And we should also have a conversation with the executive branch in order to, you know, promote this, uh, promote public policy making in an area in particular. And this can be done from our um, sectors, for instance, the, the associations of physicians, the different types of uh, professional associations. We can promote elements in order to help with public policy making and help with finding solutions as well. This is why it's also important to identify these specific aims and their target audience. We also need to select the main um, our main messages. We can't provide everyone with all the information. As I always say, the political world has no time, so they're not going to read papers. You know, they 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 won't read scientific production. That would be very hard. But that scientific production can maybe be uh, included in a two minute policy brief or something like that. Now with the right citations, you know, so that we can summarize the topic. We should also evaluate our resources, human resources, economic resources, etc. We should select advocacy tactics. We should conduct a risk analysis, for instance, um, because my policy might be trapped somehow or maybe it has rolled back. We should prepare for monitoring and e evaluation work. We should think about our successes and also what we can modify within our public policy proposal. We should also ha always have monitoring and assessment because if we keep on doing something that hasn't been assessed, we might realize at the very end that our, our main objective has not been fulfilled. We also need to select our advocacy tactics, as we said before. Here we have the issue of uh, lobbying, as I was saying, talking to, you know, political stakeholders so that we can, um, you know, tell them about our problem, the problem we can, we want to solve. Um, also using social media and communication in general. This is a way to, you know, influence public policy. We can also organize a public campaign or a popular uh, mobilization. And nowadays, Extinction Rebellion scientists are organizing public campaigns. And also, I think it's Stop Oil that is organizing these interventions. So we might agree or not, uh, but it can be done, you know, because they, they, are, they, are, they are intervening public paintings. They want to call people's attention and they are managing to do so. So what happens after these interventions? And what is your public policy proposal? We also need capacity building. It also includes training civil society stakeholders, political stakeholders. This might be a way to uh, also develop public policy. Then also legal impact and litigation. There are some legal processes which are strategic. Many times we are not trying you know, to uh, win a case, but it might be a strategy uh, when we try to implement a public policy and also networking and coalition building. For instance, in Chile, sorry, I'm, I'm giving another Chilean example, but this is what I know about. In Chile, we had some water issues. You know, Chile has uh, the water, the water use uh, rights are private. You know, water is private in Chile. So, given this issue, we have uh, proposed uh, a constitution amendment, and also we would like to reform the the water code. But it was the civil society that made this suggestion. At the time, it was impossible to promote this reform just uh, through one organization. 
it wasn't enough. Uh, a single organization couldn't do this because the idea was to challenge the power and challenge those who hold the water use rights. And this is, in this case, we can also create a coalition. Um, it, this coalition was called Coalition for Water and Life. They uh, participated actively until the, re the reform is, uh, you know, um, proposed. And after 10 years, there was a major reform when it comes to water property rights in Chile. We managed to add uh, something about ecosystem functions and sustainability functions as well uh, regarding the environment. It was important to include this uh, in this more private vision, but now it's, it's geared towards a more public uh, perspective. And the idea is to, you know, cater to the common good. Networking is also important in, all, in order to develop better quality public policies. We should also think about how to place the issues I work on in the public agenda. Uh, we need to define the problem to be addressed. We need to analyze if the issue has been addressed. We can also suggest public policies uh, by saying, I don't know, um, um, this marine uh, animal is not being protected, but uh, uh, maybe there are 10 bills of law that are protecting that animal. We need to know what's happening, if uh, the topic has been addressed in parliament or not. We need to create documents, simple documents that uh, explain the topic in a simple way. People read less and less, less and less. So we need to create impactful products. If the people are interested, they will want to read the report. We should contact political stakeholders who may be interested in the subject. We should write opinion columns, seminars, live, uh, organize live sessions, you know, use the social media. We should present the issues in institutional spaces. And usually national congresses have a hearing, uh, hearing sessions, uh, and you can talk to them. And we should also value the topics with the communities if possible. We should have this, you know, top top. Uh, down bottom up approaches because political um, life cannot just be dictated from the top uh, down. Okay, some interaction. Uh, how much experience do you have when it comes to providing scientific data uh, uh, to the public policy making process? So, have you helped in public policy making or not? And that's number one. And number two, do you use the social media uh, from your place of work? Because as I was saying, the social media are essential when it comes to um, implementing all this. Without these elements, it's very difficult to um, have this citizen backing because we need to, to tell people about all this. So please answer these questions in the chat. Now I would like to tell you about three examples. This academician is a lawyer, Veronica Delgado, from uh, the University of Concepcion. This academician, you know, worked uh, within her university until she actually made some remarks about the climate change law. And those uh, remarks were very important because she managed to include their uh, uh, water-related elements. This climate change law focused on climate change mitigation, a little bit on adaptation. And these academicians started to use Twitter mainly, and we started to get to know her, people started to talk to her, you know, the political world noticed her and her arguments. So of her own accord, she started to sell some improvement ideas for the, uh, to the commission that was working on the Climate Change Bill of Law. This was very interesting because she positioned the topic as a, as a trending topic, and this was important because um, uh, then people saw that the climate change law needed to address water issues. She also suggested some improvements uh, to be made to the Bill of Law. And finally, she used the social media to position the issue in the, in the agenda. 
this and she will she even created a, a legislative follow-up program that analyzes um the the process of climate related bills of law in the national congress so this case includes several of the elements we have gone through the idea is you know to do advocacy work when it comes to public policy making she suggested some uh, improvements to the climate change law she used twitter for instance um, quite a lot in order to um, do her work her participation was very successful uh, in the uh, process of uh, creation of this law. Example number two, uh, Dr. Fernanda Salinas, an ecologist, she participated in several public policies processes in the National Congress. One of them, the Bill to Great Biodiversity Service, a bill to, to uh, that state of the forest industry should be evaluated in the environmental evaluation system. She has prepared trial reports for trials that have had positive results, and also she has uh, she has written opinion columns, uh, policy briefs, and she has worked with the political world talks and minutes, etc. So she has uh, talked about all this, and her work has had an impact because the world also uses Twitter. Several senators wrote to her. Uh, asking her opinion, and this created, you know, a connection. So now, uh, then she was able to send the information and to, um, she could also send information to the public she could, and she could also interact with the public world. So these two elements and the citizen position are, are very important. Of course, she's, her aim is to improve the common good. And this has to do with the forest industry in our country. It, which is a problem because they are not environmentally assessed. We have, you know, hectares of pine trees and eucalyptus, and they are not environmentally assessed. So she has been surveying uh, if, uh, this topic, and this has affected public policy making because now we have a bill of law that is trying to improve on the situation. Example three. Uh, and they have, this has to be with networking. Uh, we, six years ago, the network of women political scientists uh, was created to disseminate the knowledge and specialties of women political scientists. It includes over 700 women political scientists that are knowledge production spaces and also the professionals support each other. For instance, in this network, uh, they have talked about, uh, you know, parity when it comes to the constitutional process, and also that the elections process should include parity elements as well. And also the Constitutional Commission actually was um, equally formed by men and women. So, um, parity, how should we calculate the ballot, which elections should be, election process should be implemented, all this was created from this network. For instance, if there is a, a, a media outlet that wants to interview a specific political scientist to talk about the elections, for instance, then we suggest someone who specializes in these topics. If someone wants to talk about the environment, then we suggest someone who specializes in the environment. If there is a specialist in public health, the same thing. So that's a way to do advocacy work regarding public policies uh, because when a specialist uh, is on tv that has uh, an impact and then that person is invited to participate in public policy making within that debate the executive branch when they are you know developing the public policy making do this or it might be the congress when they receive this uh, public policy they might invite these specialists because they participated in the uh, media and in the um, public opinion process. And this is another major way to influence public policy using the social media, uh, also helping uh, public opinion. Uh, they write all the time, they write reports, they work with the political world. So, so this might lead to uh, positive advocacy strategies. How do we build a communication strategy? Well, uh, 
to summarize, we need to set the topic, project audience. We need to check if we have a budget. We need to set the objectives. We need to define the team and the roles. Sometimes some people want to, you know, focus on a topic. Also defining the strategy to be used, information cha channels as well, which are very important, be it TV, newspapers, digital media, and the use of uh, media in general. The, uh, a very interesting uh, topic. If we cannot launch a campaign, we might look up for a, a, a group doing something, some, uh, something similar, and we can join their work. I've done this. Some communities are working on the environment, for instance, uh, wetlands, but they don't know about public policy. So I can help them um, by providing them with information regarding how to put together a campaign to disseminate the topic. So from your, your own position, you can also help other groups so that they can promote their own topics. Many academicians have participated with communities. They have uh, shared with them, you know, the hard uh, arguments because the civil society and the academia need to be careful and they need to have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, solid arguments because people are going to question us at some point or challenge us. We need to have a robust information to um, prevent that. Just by way of example, if you would like to have to organize a campaign, uh, how uh, I would say that these are the major social media to consider, you know, in a, in a larger campaign. If you're an academician, you can use Twitter and Instagram. That's already a lot. Oh, oh. And if you're doing something by yourself, maybe you don't have the support of a community. Instagram, Twitter, they allow us to post information, key information about a given topic, you know, the Twitter threads and other things. We need to remember that if we're going to organize a campaign with a group of people, you need a website to have, to include the major information. For instance, this is the example of a campaign that I worked on, uh, Vota Sin Represas or Vote Without um, Retaliations. In 2013, the political world needed to say, uh, sorry, it was not retaliation. This is Vote Without Dance. And uh, so the politicians needed to say if they were in favor of the dams or not, because five huge dams were to be built in the country. So this campaign aimed to have politicians to say if they were against or in favor of dam building. We used Facebook because we have, this is a, a platform used by people over 50. We needed to reach different types of audiences. And this, social uh, media has different function, functions which allow us to interact with visitors. We also use Twitter because it's, even though it can be too toxic, um, if we have a clean timeline, uh, we use the necessary blocking tools and we don't spend our energies and, and arguing with people who don't want to have a constructive discussion, then Twitter can be a good way input in a few words, uh, an interesting idea. So, and it can be uh, good when it's read by a journalist. Um, many times I was able to discuss the issues I care about because I put my opinion on the social media and the traditional mainstream media is monitoring this social media. So from putting your opinion as an expert on an issue, this then this can lead to, to being contacted by the media. Also YouTube, um, exposing your arguments about, for example, a bill, if you take part in a public hearing in Congress, you can find the recording of that. So you can post that on YouTube, Instagram as well. 
it allows you to reach a younger audience using video reels you can do lives where you can have a more casual conversation among four people so we can uh, have an issue and we can bring specialists uh, to discuss uh, that and then it can get stay posted there and we can also invite for example a politician to debate around these issues so using all of these communication elements is very interesting uh Twibon is a detail in twitter when you can show a campaign mark uh, for example this is one that was used uh, for the fridays for future campaign so it's sort of a way to show that i support this campaign that i support this cause mailchimp is a subscription and newsletter tool you can um, keep people up to date on what you're working on it's a free tool i usually work with all of these because they are free and there it's easy for communities to use these tools to have an impact on public policy so we can take advantage of all of these tools especially because they're free whatsapp you also have a distribution list you can disseminate a lot of information to make all of your events uh, that you're organizing viral and also we have campaign implementation to discuss this is an example when we worked on the vota sin represas vote without dams and we reached um, congress in patagonia uh, we we went and told them in patagonia we can't have these many uh, dams so we need a definition on energy policy that is the public policy that we needed an impact on and so all of these politicians made the commitment to work on an energy public policy because in chile for many many years the public the policy around energy was to, not to have a public policy on energy so uh, we asked all of these politicians and we sort of made them take a position on whether they were going to take a position for dams or against them and we worked with all of those who were running for president in the primaries we looked for political support these pictures are different politicians who supported our campaign and this was sending a message to president candidates because they were going to take part in a conference organized by the big hydroelectric companies so we garnered a lot of popular support we connected with citizens people also who actors who uh, were on tv and lots of different people you have we have 10 more minutes thank you carlos we created there were some ads that were interesting for people and the memes that we cannot let leave out i think the memes are very interesting because it's an image and a short message that can um, sometimes spark a debate because there's people who perhaps are not even going to read all of the information that I'm giving, but with that meme, they're going to, to get an idea and an opinion. So with a joke, it's a way to connect and, and create an opinion. At one point, I had a meme because at some point I said that mining wasn't green. And so they created a meme with me that that was kind of went viral it was shared a lot and even a seminar so they stopped uh, saying sustainable mining or green mining because of that criticism that i had said that extractivism cannot be sustainable or green you, we can talk about mining but we cannot say that it's uh, sustainable 
any extraction of fossil fuels or minerals cannot be sustainable. So that was my criticism. And that meme was a way of, of making that message and this rhetoric reach a wide audience. And so that help so that the, the correct public policies are, are made. That That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Pamela. The chat has been very active. We have lots of questions that I'm going to read now. Some of the ones that were the, perhaps the most interesting to be, read in these few minutes. Pamela Rava asked about the process of planning advocacy. Um, is it in a, in a group, in a collective group? Because that's difficult. Is it made up of what? NGOs, political parties, academia? Well, I would say advocacy can be individual, personal. For example, if it's done from academia, it's validated and respected by the politicians that we want to have an incidence on. But we can also do it collectively. So you can go as an individual, as an expert on, on an issue to help build public policy, the research that is done by researchers. Dr. Rojas here in Chile on her own with a senator promoted wetland protections. And then they joined the network, the wetlands network to, to find some synergies there. So we need to find some common points, but we can do that individually, especially from academia, because academia also always has uh, the repository of information that can help bring those arguments uh, to help uh, improve public policy so that it can have better results and we can have better quality public policies. Next, uh, Leticia Gomez asked, how can we um, advocate from academia if transnational companies have a larger influence? Well, I would say um, at least what I'm seeing, at least the corporate world, is it pulling back or it's not having as much influence as it used to because it's uh, the per public perception around that uh, has changed. So I think they're not having as good results as they used to because right now there are a lot more channels for transparency. So I think academia needs to fill the, the space in Congress where the debates are taking place in public hearings. Because when there are there is a bill being uh, discussed uh, and I'm not invited, then I, I'm going to ask to be heard in those public hearings. Each country has uh, different ways uh, for, for bills, but there's always a, a kind of process, like a process like this one in Congress and a bill always should take into account either the public good or health. So finding the stakeholders um, that have an influence, I can reach and bring my, my influence. So that is why I showed those examples of the Dr. Fernanda Salinas and Dr. Veronica Delgado, because on their own, they weren't invited. They went on their own to Congress and they use social media, for example, to disseminate an opinion column, for example, to show how a bill could be improved. That's one example. Thank you. Next, um, Andrea Lovato Cordero asks, how can we prevent uh, progress made in public policy to, to be weakened by changes in administrations? 
Well, uh, I'm an activist and on environmental issues. And what we have been doing is try to uh, reach commitments and, and get commitments uh, before elections. So we ask for meetings with all candidates for president to, to look at their agenda. Sometimes they're open to discuss and include things around energy, the environment, what kind of bills are necessary. Going through, through the different uh, public policies so we can ask for a public policy to be continued if it's good. For example, in the election, the last election where it was Piñera against Bachelet, we asked President Piñera to continue with the policy that was conducted by Bachelet in the biodiversity service, and it was continued. And the new president, the new administration is also uh, continuing with that. So we also need to also be there to uh, demand that they actually implement that. We need to be active and uh, work on the arguments so that uh, on why this is good for the community so that it's not questionable. Thank you so much, Pamela. We have another question from Gabriel Parrenao. And it's what are the entities that uh, work on harmonizing public policy among countries? Are there any? Well, I would say um, I don't think there are, there is any harmonization. Uh, international treaties sometimes provide an umbrella where we're all kind of uh, under that, but to bring that into a specific public policy that's up to each country. We have the CASU agreement um, between different countries, uh, but each country then creates their own public policy. Some uh, are more advanced than others. But what is important is to build exchanges um, on public policies. And so we can so see if a country is doing something that is great, then why do we need to reinvent the wheel? We can take um, pointers from that. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Roberto Perez asks, um, there are many examples of, of advocacy in the region that um, it sort of refer to the constitution. Oh, well, I'm not. My, uh, do, do I understand if you're asking um, whether constitutions foster these um, spaces for advocacy? I'm, I'm not sure what the question was. Yeah, I lo, I me lo aclara. Dice que oh, siempre... they, they attack the policies claiming they're unconstitutional. Yes, uh, well, yes, that, that is something that happens where when we were working on the water reform uh, in Chile, they told us that it was unconstitutional. So we need to look at an, a strategy we need to work on the messages that we need to, to show. We need to find a way around that. It's sometimes a mistake to present a very radical change that mobilizes or causes um, a lot of, of uh, a big al alarm among the sectors that have st uh, stakes on this issue. So sometimes changing just a word in uh, in a law can have an effect. So I need to work on how I can have an impact and bring change within the constitutional framework. For example, in the water code, we brought um, a change that has an effect on all the water use um, processes, we showed that the, the law wasn't being um, complied with, and we were able to 
to make that reform successful, but we worked to, on that for 10 years. I'm not going to tell you it was easy, but if you're there and you worked and, and if you have the arguments on your side and you have robust, solid arguments, then you can be successful. So it's something that we need to monitor continuously that, that the issue is working, it's going in the right direction. Great. Um, thank you, Pamela, for your great presentation and for your time. We have a few minutes in our session where we wanted to say goodbye to everyone. And we would like the representatives from the different institutions, um, BAHO, IAI, Haley, if they are here, we, perhaps they would like to say some words in this final session. So now scientific, we're going to give the floor to scientific director of IAI. Carlos, can you hear me? Thank you, Pamela, for this great presentation. I can see that there was a lot of interest um, among the attendees. And it's a great way to close this course because in these last few weeks, we have been going from science to public policy for the purpose of generating evidence that can serve society, civil society, and also governments at the different levels. So thank you so much, Pamela, for sharing your knowledge. And I'm sure this is going to give a boost to the teams that are working on, on their proposals. And they're going to bring this knowledge uh, in their interactions. The IAI is very happy to close this course, this collaboration with PAHO and the Global Consortium on Health and Climate. As Carlos was said, uh, we're already working uh, in collaboration with Health Canada and of course for next year for the purpose of building a practice community for the Americas and beyond to have this community serve as an interface between uh, public policies on health and science to create evidence to support public policies for the improvement of the health of people uh, throughout the Americas and not just the health of human beings, but also our environment and all of the elements that support life, air, water, etc. So congratulations, Pamela, and everyone who has taken part in this course, all facilitators, as you can see, there's a big group of people behind this course. We have been holding meetings for a long time and we're committed to this process and all of the work that is starting um, for many of you with the groups that are moving on to the second phase. If you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to hesitate to contact us. We're here. If you have any opportunities that you find that you want to share with this group, you can send them to us and we can share them with the rest of the group. And hopefully that is the purpose of the hub that Carlos mentioned that we're going to share with you. The idea is to share opportunities, also funding opportunities. Maybe some people can get to publish their work or they can cooperate with others in networks. I really liked what Pamela said about the importance of the regional exchange and what's happening in the country and how, what we can learn from that. Um, I think that you're doing that in that course. The groups you have been creating, you know, I'm so impressed by the efforts, uh, the effort you have made in order to create these networks. And now I would like to close this with a brief anecdote. Two or three weeks ago, I met with Carlos Barbosa. He works at the Ministry of Public Health of Uruguay. He invited us uh, to attend uh, an internal uh, meeting here. We have Carmen Siganda from the Ministry of Public Health. 
the workshop was on, on climate change adaptation. Uh, Yulawai is now launching its national adaptation plan. And we talked about this in the workshop and in the team, um, you know, half the people that were leading this effort in their countries had participated in a very similar workshop uh, 10 years ago. And nowadays they are leaders in the region and in the countries they are promoting uh, you know, uh, evidence for adaptation action in their countries. So I know that you will continue, you know, working, replicating this knowledge throughout the region. You are the region's leaders, and it's an honor to serve you. And we'll be here throughout this process. Carlos, thank you so very much. Thank you, Anna, for your words. Uh, Haley, maybe you'd like to say something as well, uh, to say goodbye. Uh, on behalf of the GCCHE. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I think Anna summed up really well, but just congratulations on everybody um, for making it to the end of this course. Um, it was a pleasure to be a part of the planning team and sort of see it come through completion. So um, last anecdote, actually, um, I am going to drop a link for the final examination for the course in the chat right now. Um, please make sure you complete it by November 10th um, at midnight if you'd like to receive a certificate for the course. And that's it for me. Congratulations again, everyone. Thank you, Haley. Uh, well, um, so the link is there. Uh, Anwar Mendes, maybe you can say something on behalf of PAHO. Everyone has summed up very well. Just to say that, you know, we're, we're really happy to see everyone be so engaged in this course. It's been a lot of work, a lot of readings, a lot of thinking hard about ideas, bringing them to the ground, and a lot of collaboration with others, which is the most important thing. Um, so we're really excited and we're really happy that this was a successful course. We hope you learned a lot, but more than anything, we hope you stay engaged, continue to work, continue to dream, continue to be hopeful and to do your best to, to see how we can, you know, make the world a little bit of a better place. So thank you for joining this course and uh, stay tuned because there's a lot more to come. Thank you. Gracias, Anwar. Bueno, como dijo Anwar, Thank you, Anwar. As Anwar was saying, now I would like to say goodbye. Hope you have a great weekend and stay tuned because we'll be um, uh, in, uh, invite you to, uh, to the Hub's launching session and with, with other news as well. So we remain in touch. Thank you very much.